Hello, everybody. This is Reed Cohen, and welcome to uh, Where in the World India. I'm going to take you to India on a PowerPoint slideshow uh, that is focused on the tour that Sarah and I do. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get rid of this horrible background of my, my office space here, and we're going to switch to the PowerPoint presentation here. And hmm. why am I not seeing that? There we go. Okay, I hope that uh, you're all seeing the Taj Mahal here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, that's just my introductory uh, slide there. Uh, what do I want to say about India? Oh, India defies explanation. It's so diverse. It's so rich. It's, it is a, a sensory overload of experiences. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dive right in here. Here's, of course, a map of India that gives you a sense of uh, you know, the subcontinent there. I think this is an image that would be familiar to everybody. This, however, is northern India. It's kind of hard to see things, but you see New Delhi up in the north. Rajasthan is to the west, the left side of the screen. Um, and we see all the way out to the right, rather small, but at about, if this were a clock face, a little bit past three o'clock, there is Varanasi. Um, this basically encompasses the imprint tours, India tour. We begin in Delhi, we finish in Varanasi, and we include uh, Rajasthan and a couple of other stops. So <clears throat> India is full of wonders, full of cool experiences. And I've decided that the best way to give you all a sense of exactly uh, what India is like um, I'm, I'm going to just show you about 50 images in succession, um, not particularly uh, stopping to discuss any of them. Uh, there'll be some interesting things that you'll be curious about, but of course I'll circle back to those um, when I get to that portion of the tour to talk about the specifics. This is just my idea of getting, giving you a feeling, a visceral sense of how India comes at you um, in all your senses, right? So this, this image right here is a picture of me talking to a couple of fellows there. I put this picture in because I wanted to see what I looked like 30 years ago when I still had brown hair and uh, 30 pounds less weight. Uh, Marangar Fort in Jodhpur. This is Jaisalmer Fort out in the Tar Desert. This is Amber Fort outside of Jaipur. So there's, there's all kinds of forts, tombs, the, uh, the holy city of Varanasi with the bathing ghats, temples, Hindu temples, Jain temples, Buddhist temples, Sikh temples, mosques, right? Uh, astrological observatories, palaces. These are, this is a Havali palace out in the Tar Desert. And then the details, right? The, you know, the, this is a country that you need to have your eyes open at all times because the details are amazing, colorful, everywhere you turn, fabulous details. Fun things, riding on the backs of elephants, you know, touristy things, of course. And a photographer's playground, absolutely spectacular. And then there's the colors of India. Everywhere you look, there is a richness of colors. Colors and textures, laundry. And then there's the street life of India. I mean, yes, you're gonna stumble across somebody, uh, a snake charmer on the sidewalk uh, looking for uh, some coins. And every endeavor that can be done, you'll find on the sidewalks. I love this shot, uh, the old and the new, a bicycle rickshaw there and a guy on his cell phone. Of course, the scenes like that are less and less 
uh, unusual. This guy's ironing, you know, that's his job, ironing on the sidewalk. This is a sidewalk hair cutter and you see behind him, there's a tailor. Uh, I've seen dentists operating on the sidewalk, not that I would let one of them touch my teeth, but you never know, beds on the sidewalk. The ubiquitous pan, you know, the betel nut chew that uh, so many Indian men uh, indulge in, the little pan vendor here has got his set up on the sidewalk. People selling food, political announcements out on the street. You might stumble upon, uh, upon a wedding in your travels in India. This is a Rajasthani wedding party. Again, the colors, kids on their way to school. Somebody wants you to ride their elephant. The ubiquitous tuk-tuks, right? The little three-wheeled motorized transport that you see absolutely everywhere in Asia, uh, sort of uh, an Indian staple. And you can see that each individual person uh, tries to style his in, an, in a unique way. When you're out on the road, there's as much creativity and color as there is anywhere else in India. This is just a, uh, on the back of our, our tour bus. This is one of the long distance uh, trucks, all decorated and nice, but you'll also see, as I said about the sidewalks in the cities, you'll also see every endeavor known to man out on the highways in the streets. This is a, a big pile of dried dung that's used for fuel being carted down the street. Uh, manpower, ox power. This is not a great photograph, but look at that folks. There's three people who have hitched a ride just on the fenders of a big long distance truck. Um, this guy's probably going 50 miles an hour down the highway. I mean, you are going to see everything under the sun when you go to India. And then there are the Indian people themselves, the faces. This is a sadhu, right? Uh, a holy man who, you know, wants money to have his picture taken. But uh, look at these faces. And by the way, as I flash through all these faces, these pictures that I've taken over the years. Do any of these people look like they were offended to have their picture taken? Uh, Indian people are friendly and engaging, right? Okay, I wanna shift gears a little bit because I also think it's very, very important to, in my introduction to the country, to not just focus on the amazing, rich diversity of, of experiences and the upside of India. I want you to know there's a downside as well. India is really, for, for real veteran travelers, right? Uh, uh, in every other country that I go to, I encourage people who wanna travel independently and I'll help them if I can. But India is a country that I really think, even for the most uh, experienced travelers, going on a tour is a good way to go. Whether it's with imprint tours, with Sarah, with me, with, or with some other outfit, India needs some insulation between you and the culture because there is a downside to India. You're going to see scenes like this everywhere you go. Just garbage piled upon the street, sacred cows, right? Bigger children. Uh, just, you know, here's a, you see there's a pig back there in the background. Yes, you're probably going to have to use a squat toilet at some point uh, on your travels in India. By the way, if, if these things put you off, then I really want you to, to consider carefully whether, uh, whether India is a good destination for you. Um, beggars. Now, there's beggars in almost every country, but in India, when you've got a billion point two people, there's a huge, huge swath of the population that is abjectly poor. And so you, you see far more of this. It's rather relentless. Everywhere you go, there's somebody who's asking for a handout. Here's a couple little beggar kids. Um, you're going to see stray animals that are just living on the street or dying on the street. Uh, power brownouts, you know, are a, 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 a part of life over there in India. And this last shot, before we actually uh, jump into the tour itinerary itself, um, I think is a really important one. If, if anybody tuned in on Monday when we had Chetan on the coffee chat, he talked about the fact that Indian people will stare at you. But what I think didn't get said is how relentless the staring is. This is a picture of um, the, my wife at the time and I sat down at an outdoor restaurant to have uh, lunch. And within seconds, we had this crowd of people. 
And the, the problem is, is that Indian people, because they've grown up in a culture where there's not much in the way of privacy and personal space, they don't feel like it's rude to stare. Um, you can be standing on a bus shoulder to shoulder with someone and you turn and you their nose is six inches from yours and they don't turn away. Um, you've got to put yourself in, your, in those shoes um, to understand how unnerving that is. We grow up, we're small children, we're staring at somebody and our mothers say, honey, honey, don't stare, don't stare. That's, that's the way we're raised. But in India, that's not the case. The staring, the begging, the pandering, the touts on the sidewalk trying to get you to come into their shop, eat in their restaurants, it's pretty relentless. So you've got to be ready to compartmentalize. That, that's such a key thing about India. You gotta be ready to compartmentalize. Uh, and in that way, set aside the negative and focus on the positive. Okay, enough said for introduction. I know that was long. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Um, we start the tour in Delhi. Uh, you know, Northern India, it's the capital, it's got the big international airport, and it's a giant megalopolis, right? It's uh, north of 20 million people. Uh, pollution is a problem there. In terms of what we do, the sites and whatnot, uh, this is India Gate. <clears throat> this is a uh, leftover uh, from the British presence in India. On the first afternoon, we get started fairly early, usually on an imprint tour. We're starting at about <clears throat> five or six in the evening. Uh, but in India, there's so much to see and do. We want to get a jump on the sightseeing. So we're starting in the early afternoon, going out, little photo stop at India Gate. And then this is the Red Fort. Um, very importantly, uh, I've chosen to leave the Red Fort out of the imprint itinerary. And the reason is, is that a vast majority of tourists who come to India visit just three cities, sorry, cities, um, Delhi, Agra for the Taj Mahal and Jaipur. They call it the golden triangle in India. And therefore the uh, hassle factor, as I've talked about before already, is very, very high in those three places. They're the place, you know, Delhi is the place where tourists arrive. It's their first experience. And so the hassle factor around the Red Fort is extraordinarily high as the number one tourist site in the city very, very high hassle factor. And because we visit what are, in my opinion, much better uh, fort experiences later on in the tour, we skip the Red Fort. But of course, we encourage independence. People usually arrive a day before the tour starts in Delhi to get acclimated uh, time-wise, time zone-wise. And uh, uh, visiting the Red Fort uh, by, by hiring a, a, a tuk-tuk and going to see it by yourself is easily possible, but it's it's an impressive uh, uh, building. The other very, very impressive building nearby is the Jama Masjid, right? The Friday Mosque. Also something that I've opted to leave out of the tour itinerary, something that you might wanna do uh, ahead of time um, if you come on one of our tours. Um, uh, similar reasons, but also because um, women are very badly treated in this mosque and I would hate to start off on the first day of a tour, having people have a bad experience of Islam. So um, the first time I went to India with a group, I took them to the Jama Masjid. Uh, it was a very, very negative experience. Um, when I blogged about it, I called it a holy, unholy experience. So um, I wanted to show those images because they are the sort of top two sites in Delhi. But what I choose is to see sort of the second tier of sites as a group. This is the Kitab Minar. Kitab Minar is a big, well, it's the tallest stone minaret um, in the world. Um, it uh, uh, was built about 800 years ago, around 1200 AD. Um, and it's part of the, uh, the Kumat al-Islam mosque complex, which was Delhi's first mosques and one of the, uh, uh, one of the first mosques in all of India. It's spectacular. It's kind of off the beaten track a little bit. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of tourists that come and visit the Kitab Minar, but uh, uh, again, this this spectacular tall um, building. It's 240 feet high and almost 50 feet in diameter. That gives you a sense of scale. But uh, the details are impressive as well. Here's the the remains of the mosque there that are on site. 
Um, after this, we go and have dinner on our first night with a Indian family uh, where we can ask questions and learn what life is like uh, in an Indian middle-class home. The following morning, we're, uh, we're gonna be heading off to Rajasthan on a, a late morning flight, but we start the morning at Humayun's tomb. Humayun was the grandfather of Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan of uh, Taj Mahal fame. So this was his grandfather. And you can see in building his own tomb that already the Mughal uh, architectural style is beginning to develop that will uh, culminate in that gorgeous building of the Taj Mahal. So this is Humayun's tomb. I love visiting first thing in the morning because you'll notice there's no people in these pictures. Even today, as tourism has exploded in India in the last 20 years, since uh, probably some of these photos were taken, by going first thing in the morning, you really avoid the crowds. And that is a key element of, uh, of the way we set up our tours in India. And that is to mitigate the issue of crowds, um, that hassle factor that I've talked about. But you can see this is a beautiful um, uh, tomb complex, uh, great first Big Bang site to kick off the tour. Um, we, de we do leave Delhi at that point, but I wanna show you a couple more images because there's still plenty of things to see in Delhi and lots to see before the tour starts if you wanna go early. This is Ashkardam uh, uh, temple and it's only about 40 years old. This is a very modern temple, but they're still making, this is one of the things I love about India. It's not just this historic past that makes them a fascinating culture. I mean, they've got their, their contemporary culture is also uh, very interesting. This is the Bir, uh, Birla Mandir, uh, a Hindu temple. I, I love it. It's like sort of a confectionery. Uh, and then the Baha'i Lotus Temple. These are three other temples that you might visit on your own uh, before the tour starts. Okay, uh, back to a map here just to show you our route from Delhi we fly to Udaipur. That would be a uh, awfully long train or bus ride. So we choose to fly this long section and then work our way back up north and, and east. Um, but at some point or at some point or another on the tour, we usually jump on a train and this is the sort of uh, comfort level that you can expect on a train. And by the way, a, a train is one of those places, if you're in a second class or first class car, where it's, it's kind of a safe zone for engaging uh, middle-class Indians, right? When you're on the street, you're being approached by poor lower-class Indians that see you as a dollar sign, that see you as somebody to sell something to or, or make some sort of profit from. But when you're on a second or first-class train car, you can be pretty sure that all the Indians on, on board with you don't want something for, from you. And that's the perfect time to engage them, strike up a conversation. Here's a family that I got to know uh, on a, about a five hour train ride up to Amritsar uh, many years ago. And it was delightful. They invited me to come home for lunch. Uh, I felt very safe doing so. This is a place, and, and, and like I said, this is on a tour, uh, Sarah or Chetan or I are always going to be able to tell you when you're in a place where it's absolutely great to reach out and try to rub elbows with the locals and when you want to sort of keep that uh, uh, protective uh, insulation for yourself. Okay, I love Udaipur. I think that the sites in Udaipur are just uh, beautiful. This is Udaipur City Palace. Um, there are many, many, many palaces in India, and uh, just like with the Red Fort and the Jama Masjid in Delhi, we won't take you to every single palace and every stop on the tour, but this is, in my opinion, the best palace experience to be had in India. Of course, we have a, a guided tour. This is what it looks like from Lake Pichola. Uh, this is one of the inner courtyards, some of the artwork here. Uh, it's, it's just a really fascinating palace experience. Chitan, uh, our intrepid guide, our intrepid tour manager will give you a guided tour. For those of you who've been tuning into Chitan this week and in previous uh, episodes, um, you know that he's incredibly knowledgeable and you can just imagine what kind of a great tour you'd have with Chitan. Then we do a classic tourist thing. We take a sunset cruise on Lake Pichola. They've got these little tourist boats. We usually have a group big enough that we have our own little private boat. And as dusk falls and the light begins to light up uh, the Udaipur waterline, you can see what a charming, enchanting place this is. Just 
beautiful architecture, several ghats coming down to the water. Here's a shot with the um, city palace in the background. And the lake is dominated by two floating palaces. That's just a descriptive phrasing for uh, palaces that have been built on little islands out in the lake. This one has been uh, converted into a, <clears throat> a high-end luxury hotel. Back in 1993, <clears throat> my first trip to India, we actually uh, spent a couple hundred bucks and indulged in staying one night out on this uh, fabulous floating hotel. I think, oh, by the way, Udaipur is prominently featured in the James Bond movie, Octopussy. And I think that this, or I, I, I know that this floating palace was the, uh, the uh, private uh, property of uh, the, the Bond girl who features prominently in that movie. There's a little swimming pool there. And of course, as, as part of the, the lake cruise, you actually get to get off and wander around on the second little floating palace island. Here you can see looking back toward the city. Great photo ops everywhere. And then one last uh, sort of James Bond site, I guess you'd say. This is the Monsoon Palace. This is where Louis Jordan, who was uh, the, the bad guy in that movie, uh, this was his, his domain. Uh, and this is an abandoned palace up on the hill. You can take a tuk-tuk to, tuk up to see it. Um, I got my slides in reverse order here. This is the view back down to the city from the Monsoon Palace. Okay, ready to move on from Udaipur. Um, <clears throat> we go overland by coach up to Jodhpur. Halfway between uh, Udaipur and Jodhpur, is uh, I think maybe the most spectacular Jain temple in Rajasthan. This is Ranakpur, just this beautiful temple, uh, Jain temple. Jain, Jainism is an offshoot of Hinduism, so uh, very, very similar, but beautiful carved marble um, uh, temple. We stop, visit the temple, have lunch here, and then continue on to Jodhpur. As beautiful as this, pal uh, sorry, this temple is from the outside, uh, it's even more impressive with the uh, carved marble interior. Look at the details there. This is the domed roof that you saw from the exterior, beautifully, intricately carved. I don't even know how a carver can carve marble down to this sort of fine detail without it. Um, uh, you know, shattering at, at every point. Uh, my first time there back in 1993, we were befriended by a, a priest. He took us down into his, his private little sanctuary where he did his prayers and uh, he sort of gave us a, a guided tour of the, of the temple. We were there in the evening when they had a, uh, uh, a temple ceremony with bells and drums. It was a, 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 a very transcendent experience. And my, for those of you who have traveled with me in the past, you know my my definition of transcendent is fairly fairly loose. Uh, I don't mean anything too terribly spiritual by that, but just anytime I have an experience in my travels where I feel like whatever is eternal in me is touched, um, I, I define that as a transcendent experience. And by that definition, the interior of Ranakpur in the evening with music and incense and candles uh, certainly fits the bill. Little Rajasthani girl. Again, you know, does anybody look like they don't want to engage you or don't want their picture taken? Not at all. But Jodhpur is our goal on that day. And the signature site in Jodhpur is mighty Marangar Fort, still owned by the family that built it uh, 300 years ago. Uh, let me check my notes to make sure about that. 500 years ago, this this uh, great fort was was started. And of course, every fort in India actually includes a palace as well, right? I mean, these were you know the the rich rulers of the region who uh, um, who who built this. So of, of course, it's not just a fort; it's got a palace inside. This one's really good. Um, 
you uh, we get you an audio guide for your tour of Marengar Fort. And the reason is, is that the, the voice of the audio guide is the current Maharaja of Jodhpur, the owner of this palace fortress. Um, can't improve on that. So we go ahead and get everybody the audio guides for the interior guy, uh, tour. Jodhpur is known as the Blue City, and here's a photograph that shows you exactly why. This is the view from up on the ramparts of the fortress, looking down into the old city of Jodhpur. As a matter of fact, um, many of you will already know, but for those of you who don't, um, Chitan on Saturday evening um, is going to be, with our Where in the World Week, is going to be doing a virtual tour of Jodhpur. Uh, Chitan's home is Jodhpur. He's going to start up on the hill with the fort and then walk down and, and give you sort of a virtual walking tour of the Blue City there. Signature clock tower. And the, the next few images are all of uh, just from, from photographing and wanderings in that old city of Jodhpur. Friendly family wants to show off their kids. Quite sure that I was invited into a home while I was wandering around with my camera here. Street vendors. By the way, I think that this guy's job is making popsicle sticks. I, I, of course, I'm, I'm trying to be funny here, but I don't really know what the sticks are for, but he's making them by hand. And that's what he does for a living all day long is take bamboo and cut it up into little sticks that get used for something. Um, the one thing that has not changed in India is, is that everything is inexpensive because the labor force is inexpensive. It's an almost inexhaustible labor force because with a billion, 200 million citizens, there's always gonna be somebody who's willing to do any job no matter how, how, how menial it might be. Um, this is the uh, Umed Bahwan uh, palace that's been converted into a luxury hotel. And now on from Jodhpur to Pushkar. Now Pushkar is uh, the home of a very, very famous festival, the Pushkar Camel Fair. The history here is that uh, Pushkar is on the eastern edge of the Great Tar Desert, and over the centuries the nomads uh, would gather once a year to buy and sell, trade cattle and, uh, and camels, right? Uh, a very, very important part of the nomadic uh, economy is owning good camels. So they would come together. And of course, over time, it evolved into a big party, like gatherings like that would always uh, inevit inevitably end up. So today, when you arrive, they still have this original function. You see camps all over the hills around Pushkar with camels all um, uh, tied up around the camps. Um, but then it has evolved, right? And you've got a, a Western style midway with carnival rides. And by the way, I've, I've included this picture, not only because of the colors, but because of the crowds, right? I mean, a, a Pushkar fair is going to be even more crowded than, than uh, the rest of India, but crowds are, you know, I don't want to I don't want to beat this to to a pulp, but uh, but cr crowds are something you're going to have to deal with, right? And 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 not the same Western sense of personal space and politeness. You get jostled, you get your feet stepped on, you get bumped. Nobody says sorry or excuse me because that's all they would be doing all day long in their culture. Is if if they had to be polite and say excuse me, they'd never get anywhere, right? So it it is a tough transition for Westerners. Um, there's a, a, a stadium there, and um, we always time the tours so that we're there for a very important day of the Pushkar Fair. I believe my fall, uh, November 5th departure coming up this fall um, that I'll be running, uh, will be there for the closing, no, sorry, for the opening day ceremonies of the fair, and then Sarah's tour that's scheduled for uh, October of 2022. Um, we've got her scheduled to be there for the closing ceremony day. Here, this, if you haven't figured this out, that's a camel, right? All comparisoned and, and uh, dressed up in a fancy cart. Here's a whole row of camels. And there, there you can see the, the uh, uh, grandstands in the background. And as Westerners, by the way, they'll clear out a space for us so we can sit in the shade on nice soft pads and whatnot and enjoy the pageantry. There's a little close-up 
of the camel. I mean, this this is what you travel for, right? The pageantry of this pushcar fair is exactly why we travel. These two guys were participants in the uh, the mustache and beard contest. Here's one of the winners. There were these performing troops. I, I, I'm guessing this is Hanuman, the, 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 the monkey god, who's an important uh, positive character in their Ramayana, right? Their, their Hindu epic of good versus evil. I can't tell you what, uh, what this girl is meant to be other than <laughs> it's spectacular. Um, and of course, beyond the official uh, entertainments of uh, and, and pageantry of the fair, there it will it attracts all kinds of buskers, right? So you're going to see people doing magic and swallowing swords and having performing monkeys. And here's this little bitty girl on the tightrope, right? So everywhere you go, there's big circles of people. You stop, you watch for a while, you toss a few coins in a hat. It's great fun. Um, I love this. This was the closing out of the final day's events, uh, the very last event of the fair, and it was 350 Rajasthani women all in their red um, saris doing a synchronized Bollywood dance. And you, you can see here, they're not professionals, but it was really amazing. And, and by the way, notice the close-up photograph that I got, because as a Westerner, I was allowed, uh, I'm, I'm a, an honored guest, in their culture, and I was allowed to walk out right on onto the parade grounds and, and get in there and take my photographs. You can actually see, uh, if I can use, oops, sorry, I didn't know that would happen. Um, uh, you guys can't see my cursor. Okay, uh, top right-hand corner, there's another Western traveler uh, taking pictures. That's not somebody with a press pass, that's just some traveler like me who, who was bold enough to walk out and ask if they could take pictures. Pushcar itself is beautiful, lots of whitewashed, houses, uh, bathing ghats around. This is one of the sacred lakes of Hindu. I, I forget exactly why the, somebody was, someone of the Hindu pantheon was born here out of the waters. Uh, but the experience of the town itself is, is not equal to the fair, but uh, Pushkar would be a worthwhile visit, uh, even if it weren't for the Pushkar fair. Um, one time when I was there, there was a Rajasthani wedding coming through. So they're, they're going through town um, singing and playing music, and she's got a cup there, right? And, and everybody then puts money in the cup for, for the bride, and she's got the elaborately uh, hennaed hands here. There's her little bride gift ves vessel for collecting money, and that group of people was followed by this sort of outrageously decorated music cart, right? This is uh, not live music, but actually if it was a wealthy family, they would have hired a live band to come along with their little uh, private procession. People who don't have that much uh, disposable income will then hire one of these music carts where they've got recorded music and they this comes along after the little procession of people. Um, again, I want to make sure you understand that there's always going to be someone like this woman who is um, trying to get me to give her money for, for something, you know, some little trinket or some sort of begging. Always part of the experience. Of course, on the tour, we'll talk about how best to deal with that. Um, I've, I've, by the way, I've done my best to make sure that all of the uh, map slides that I have up here are more or less of the same scale and more or less of the same um, uh, uh, more or less the same scale to give you a sense of of how far we go on a, on a given day. And you can see here's your little visual marker. The New Delhi is. Uh, up at the top to the right of center. That's We'll use that as a marker going forward. So this is just our, our travel day from Pushkar to Jaipur. It's about a half day driving. Um, and on the way, um, we make a couple of stops. Um, but before I pull away from that, I've got a question from Evelyn Baker that uh, uh, asking, is there a chance to ride a camel? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's something that can be arranged. But I do have to say, Evelyn, if that experience of riding a camel is something that's important to you, 
the Morocco tour is the one where we have that truly magical experience uh, out on Camelback. So, but, but yes, absolutely. At the push car fair, it would be so easy for us to arrange for you to have a camel ride. Absolutely. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, I mentioned we make a stop on our way between Pushkar and Jaipur. It's the town of Ajmer. This is not a great photograph because it's taken through a window. But this is the Red Temple in Ajmer. Uh, it's a, another Jain temple, and it's like a giant indoor diorama. Uh, here's the better shot here. You see all the windows in the background there. That's, that's where you walk around take your pictures, but every picture has to be taken through a window, right? Because they've got it all completely glassed off. But this is a, uh, a a giant model, if you will, of the Hindu cosmos with the, the Meru, the sacred mountain in the middle, and then the sacred seas all around. It's just another, I'm going to use the word spectacular example of the diversity here, right? You know, you can visit 15 temples and it's a completely different experience every time, uh, as opposed to, I mean, I love Thailand, don't get me wrong, but after a while, after you've seen half a dozen, eight temples in Thailand, they start to feel the same. Not so in India. Travel 100 miles, get a completely new set of architecture. Um, the destination on this day was... Um, Oh, and by the way, I should back up, you know, Evelyn had her great question about riding the camel. Uh, if you want to use the chat function on the, uh, uh, on the Facebook page to, to make a comment or ask questions of me that I can address live here, um, please feel free to do that. I should have said that up front. Um, Jaipur. This is Jaipur. They, they call it the pink city. Uh, I'm, I'm a tiny little bit colorblind, but this looks a little bit more orange to me. But uh, anyway, the, the old city walls are this uh, pinkish color known as the pink city. Uh, probably the signature landmark here is the Hawa Mahal, the palace of the winds. Uh, the Hawa Mahal is one of those that is not very interesting inside. So all we will do is fill, facilitate a really good photo opportunity. We'll stop here at the Hawa Mahal on the way out to something outside of Jaipur uh, in the morning when the sun is just right for a nice photograph. I, I believe that the Hawa Mahal was on the front cover of uh, the Lonely Planet India book a few years ago. Um, Jaipur has a very uh, interesting city palace. It's not one that we include on the tour, but of course on every imprint tour we do our best to pack in our uh, tour activities in the morning and give you as many free afternoons as possible. You'll definitely have lots of free time in Jaipur. So if you want to see one more palace, you can come and see the Jaipur City Palace. I mean, they're all impressive. They're all worthwhile. What I choose to do instead is something that's more unique. This is the Jantar Mantar. It's about 300 years old. And this was a, an, eight, an early 18th century um, astronomical observatory, right? This is for measuring the movement of the stars and the skies, only it's just a vast, vast scale. If you look over at three o'clock on the right side of the picture, you see some people standing in front of that one structure that gives you a sense of scale here. These are immense. Those are, those are pigeons up there, again, for a little sense of scale. And you see two people in the bottom right-hand corner, again, to give you a, a sense of scale here. And you can see there's a, there's a big fort on the hill in the background there. We'll go visit that in a moment. I just think this is fascinating. This, <laughs> these giant measuring instruments that are... Uh, of, of gargantuan scale. All right, uh, the signature destination site uh, of Jaipur is Amur Fort, Amur Fort Palace. Uh, like I said before, you, you never just, you see very few forts that are single purpose, right? There's, there's a fortress and then there's a palace inside. This is an exceptional experience, so we definitely include it. Um, by the way, uh, when I took this particular picture, uh, it was a very, very poor monsoon that year and so the that's usually a lake there at the foot of Amur Palace. Um, Amur but 
but spelled like amber, A-M-B-E-R. So this is this spectacular limestone fortress palace. It's about a 20 minute drive outside of Jaipur. And you can see that you can, you can ride an elephant up the ramp. We used to include the elephant ride up uh, on the tour, but um, we, we've stopped doing this uh, uh, out of concern for the elephants themselves. And uh, there are other places in the world where we know that elephants are well cared for. That's a different story altogether. But uh, now we, we, instead of riding up on the elephants uh, up to see Amherfort, um, we, we, take, uh, we take the road up with, with uh, Jeeps. But they are fun to see, no doubt about it. You get up all the way on top, this huge courtyard, you see that big uh, giant uh, wall that snakes up the, the hillside uh, in the background there. And then we have a, a, our guided tour of the palace complex, palace gardens. This, this is a good palace experience, definitely. Details, really fabulous details. And uh, before we leave here, we stay and <clears throat> have our dinner in the restaurant that's actually in the palace, uh, which is really uh, a lovely, lovely experience. Um, and um, up above Amr is Jaigar Fort, right? So you can, you can just look out any of the windows up the hill, and there's another spectacular fort uh, up on the next hill up. Um, this is a, the view from Jaigar back down to... Uh, to Amur, and there's a really good shot where you can see the, the fortification walls that spread out over the hills and the big tank at the bottom right uh, that would be filled with water under normal circumstances. Okay, time to move on from Jaipur. Our next stop is Agra. Agra needs no explanation. That's where we're going to see the Taj Mahal. But of course, this is India. You can't drive 50 miles without passing by some other fabulous thing to stop and see. This is the Chambiori uh, step well. This is a, a, a feature of Rajasthan. There's actually a lot of them down in the Gujarat. Um, but these were wells that were built. And um, they're just these beautiful structures um, that served a, a, a fundamentally utilitarian purpose, and that was to gain access to the water table, which is quite deep in, the, in, in this part of desert India. Uh, so we, we stop here for half an hour, 45 minutes. I believe the last time we stopped there, there was somebody making bangles by hand. I took a little video of it. Um, you know, there's just every single day there is something that uh, marks it as special. And there's more. Before we get all the way into Agra, we have to stop at uh, uh, Fatapur Sikri. Fatapur Sikri uh, was, was founded in 1571 by Akbar. I might have my, my family tree uh, mixed up a little bit, but I believe Akbar is the great grandfather of Shah Jahan and the father of uh, Humayun, whose tomb we saw back in Delhi. He built a capital city here at Fatapur Sikri and then immediately abandoned it. Apparently, they didn't take the energy or the time to find out whether there was um, a, a, enough of a good water source and it gets almost immediately abandoned. I mean, within a single lifetime, this capital city is built and then abandoned. So it's this ghost town out in the middle of nowhere, very evocative. I love this shot. Uh, Akbar used to have his throne there on top of this pedestal and you see there are the four uh, little bridges out to the corners, and in each corner there would be like a Christian priest, and in the other corner uh, an Islamic imam, and in the other corner a Sikh why, uh, sadhu, and in the other corner a Hindu uh, sadhu, and he would debate, and because he was a very open-minded, liberal, progressive thinking ruler, he would have them all, you know, share their wisdom and, and religious knowledge, and he would sit in the middle, uh, sort of like uh, uh, King Arthur's round table idea, right, that he was equidistant from everybody so as not to put one above the other. Fascinating, I think. But the whole experience is, uh, is good, and like I said, the fact that it's completely abandoned just makes, adds a level of, of fascination here. Oh, and the, and the mosque here is a much better experience of a mosque um, than that one 
in uh, uh, than the one back in Delhi. Okay, I've got another question here. Actually, let's look at let's have something like that on the screen while I answer this question. Um, how's the air quality in northern India? Your beautiful pictures look very clear with blue sky. I spent three weeks in southern India in Pune, which is down by uh, Bombay, uh, on a business trip in January 2020, and there were some really bad pollution days. They burn lots of open fires on the streets. Uh, yeah, Joyce, uh, thanks for your question. That's a good one. Um, and I don't want to mislead you. Yeah, it's uh, when we choose to go in November, October and November because of the push car fare. But it's also a tough time of the year in India because they, they do have that uh, practice of burning their crop fields at the end of every growing season. And so there quite often are hazy days. Um, and uh, I, I don't mean to be misleading by showing only pictures of when I've been in India at other times of the year and the, and the sky is clearer. Um, Delhi is a, as bad as anywhere I've ever been. Delhi, Cairo, you know, you, you get off the airplane at the Delhi airport, the Indira Gandhi International Airport, and the sky is yellow. I'm, I, I don't want to mislead anybody at all. It's, it, it, Delhi is really badly polluted. But the rest of India, the rest of the places we stop, uh, it's, it's just an issue of occasionally having haze, uh, not so much pollution. But Delhi is polluted, to be sure. Okay, Taj Mahal. I mean, this is sort of the pinnacle of most people's experience. Uh, you know, what, what can I add to what's been said about the Taj Mahal? Anything that I might say uh, would pale in comparison. I, I do like uh, what the uh, Indian mystic poet uh, wrote, he said, the Taj Mahal is like a teardrop on the cheek of eternity. Um, amazing, beautiful place. And like always, uh, the details are as impressive as the overall picture. Um, we won't see the Taj Mahal without people. You know, a lot of these pictures are from 1993. Um, but uh, of course, we're going to go. We're going to have a good experience there. Um, I mentioned the details. This is the uh, a close up shot of the uh, Petra Dura, right? The inlaid stone artwork of the interior. And those are actual uh, precious and semi precious stones that are embedded in the carved marble. And uh, we will always stop and ask one of the guards inside. They always carry a flashlight. And for a tip, they'll put the flashlight on the the uh, embedded uh, semi-precious stone and you see it glow from within, right? If it's really a ruby or an emerald or a sapphire or something, very, very impressive. Um, I only have one photo to share today of the, uh, the fort there in Agra, um, but I, I think it's an important one um, because of the history here, right? Shah Jahan, who, who built the Taj Mahal as a tomb for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who dies in childbirth after I think it was her 15th child or something like that. He was crushed. He really loved her. He had, he had many wives, but she was his favorite. So he builds the Taj Mahal for her. And he did intend to have a black mirror image Taj Mahal built on the other side of the Yuma River for his own tomb. But long before any of those things could take place, he was um, toppled from the throne by his son, who was a a Muslim and a religious zealot, and um, Aurangabad, I believe was his name, um, in, imprisons Shah Jahan in Agra Fort within sight of the Taj Mahal. And that's why I put this image in here. That's, that's me standing at a window of the Agra Fort with that view of the Taj Mahal that Shah Jahan would have had uh, for the last 20, 25 years of his life as he lived in, uh, in prison, if you will. Plenty of other things to see in, in, in Agra. This is the tomb of Akbar at Sikandra. Uh, again, uh, an easy tuk-tuk ride out on your free time if you wanna go out and see this. Again, the inlaid details are as impressive as the overall view. All right, next stop on the tour is um, <clears throat> Kujraho. Uh, but on the, uh, as always, you, you know, that's too far to drive without stumbling across some other spectacular uh, uh, site. So I want to stop and show you Orcha on the way. Um, by the way, just uh, uh, in, in terms of logistics, 
When we leave Agra, we take a train in the morning. We go about four hours on the train. We get picked up by a coach uh, and we visit Orcha. Um, Orcha was the capital of the Bundela dynasty. So the, there's a fort here uh, and then some uh, temples and chhatris, which are our funerary monuments. Uh, cenotaphs is another word for a chhatri. Um, and so these are all about 500 years old. This is kind of, this is a quick stop. We stop and and see the fort, see you know see the chhatris from a distance, and then have a little bit of quick lunch before heading on further south to uh, Kajraho. Um, but when I was there in I think in 2010 with the group, my first group, we just happened to be there when there was a, a local festival, right? Uh, the, it was a festival that celebrated women. They were all coming from the countryside to go to the temples there in in Orcha to celebrate. And they all had their finest, beautiful saris on. And it was just, it was one of those serendipitous experiences that I can't promise to you on the tour. Um, but uh, the, the city got flooded with color, right? This is just a bunch of women from the countryside having their lunch by the river. And um, they were arriving in, in trucks, in track, on the back of tractors, any, any vehicle they could get a hold of that they could squeeze people into. Um, they were all piled in and heading into Orchard for the day. And again, look at those faces, right? Look, big smiling faces, people waving, engaging you. Um, India is a friendly place. But the destination is Kajraho, uh, some of the most beautiful Hindu temples in all of India. Beautifully preserved because these are um, actually... Um, a thousand to eleven hundred years old. These are really, really old temples. Really beautiful. Um, I'm going to use the word "discovered" in 1830, even though that's really a misnomer. The 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 British, a British archaeologist, was taken to them by the locals. I mean, of course, they were never lost by the locals, right? But from a Western perspective, nobody had seen images of Kajraho prior to the 19th century, and when they found them, they created quite a stir. The, the, the real signature element of Kajraho temples is the exterior sculpting, right? The, the bow relief sculpting uh, around the temple. And uh, what created a stir, remember the 1830s, you're talking about Victorian England and Victorian morals and much of the exterior decoration of this temple, we would probably call erotic. Um, the fact is, it was not erotic a thousand years ago. Uh, Hindus a thousand years ago, and even to this day, consider the sexual act to be uh, an, an act of transcendence, right? Of, of it's, it's the closest you get to, to true communing with the gods, and in that there's tremendous power and power of protection. So by depicting people in, in all kinds of Kama Sutra poses of, of, of intercourse, you are uh, uh, putting symbols of protection around this this sacred sacred place, um, but it's you know it's it's pretty graphic. But not every uh, statue on Kajraho is is quote unquote erotic. Uh, this is one of the Apsaras. I love this one. Can you see? She's removing a thorn from the bottom of her foot. I mean, it's, it's an everyday everyday scene. And then you know elephants and and warriors. Here's Ganesha, the elephant-headed god, uh, the remover of obstacles, very popular in Indian culture. More elephants and soldiers here. So it's, you know, it's, it's not all um, erotica, but absolutely a spectacular stop on the tour. Um, I love this picture because, you know, I showed you the picture of all the garbage in Delhi. Uh, so they've got a real problem, but they're trying, right? They're trying to educate the next generations. <laughs> this is a garbage can that says, please use me in both Hindi and English. Um, love it. Also, you see the temples in the background here. This is a, a just a restaurant that I love to frequent because of this tree house, right? There's a tree house there with table and benches. About eight people can sit out there and have a cold beer at the end of a hot day of temple viewing. Uh, just good fun. There's one of the temples before we move on to the last stop on the tour. By the way, this tour is 14 days long. 
uh, we fly, uh, this, this shows the road route, right? But we fly from Kajraho to Varanasi. Varanasi is the most sacred city uh, for Hindus. It's right on the river Ganges. Um, Ganga is how they pronounce the name of the river there. The, the, excuse me, the river Ganga. And this is a, at once in the same time, one of the worst sort of armpits of India, but also this super sacred place. I mean, you, you, if you've got a pulse, you pick up on the spiritual vibe of this place. And the way that you experience it in the classic way is a sunset or a sunrise a boat trip on the Ganges, right? You hire a little boat, somebody rows you around, it's quiet, and, and the only noises are coming from, from the banks. And you are able to then at dusk see the bathing ghats, right? The ghats are just a series of steps that come down to the river. The sun sets off on the other side of the river. Uh, so we will do this as a group, right? We'll be into, in a couple of larger boats, not just two or three of us, but all of us together in a boat or two. And we'll be rowed up and down the, gang, the Ganga. And we'll stop to observe uh, Arti. Arti is the ceremonial bidding of good night to the river Ganga, right? They consider the Ganga almost like a living, spiritual, you know, godlike being. And so there's this whole ceremony of the priests, uh, you know, with, with music, with, with, uh, with drums, with cymbals, uh, incense. And then, of course, they've all got these lit, uh, not torches, but uh, uh, lamps. This is, this is what you travel for. I mean, this, this is a really special experience to be able to experience. And I believe that uh, uh, our guest on Coffee Chat on Wednesday, uh, Chris Coleman, probably talked about RT um, up at, in Rishikesh, where she had gone to study yoga. So this, this takes place all over India, but this one in Varanasi is the most famous one. These are the ghats, probably, yeah, that's gotta be early morning, right? Before there's too many people out. And this is another separate experience, right? I mean, you see, you see the sort of formal, you know, gathering of crowds for the, for the RT, but in the morning, what you see is very, very individual. It's people coming down to the river to have their ablutions, their, their sacred cleansing, right? It's, um, it's very personalized. It's, it's, you know, and, and, and by the way, if, if this makes you feel a little bit voyeuristic, remember that there, there really is no such thing in India. There, there's no real sense or concept of privacy there. Um, but for us, it feels a little bit like we're looky-loos here. But it really is a fabulous experience to just paddle along quietly and seeing these devout people coming down to bathe in the river, and then they'll go to a temple somewhere for whatever, whatever their purpose was. If you are a devout Hindu and you have the means, you want to, at the end of your life, come to Varanasi and have your remains cremated, cremated here. It's just more shots of, of what you see from the, from the Ganges. And this is a shot from the distance. I'm uh, oh, sorry, not quite there yet. I thought this was the ba uh, burning gun. Oh, uh, this is an important shot. You would think that once you're out on the river in a boat, that you would escape any sort of beggars, touts, or uh, people trying to sell things. But no, they are creative. This woman has paddled out. And uh, this is from 20 years ago. She'd rigged up a... a car battery and a television and she's selling dvds right she's selling i think they're pretty much music videos is what they were um, but this is just to show you that that even out on the river you're not going to escape that hassle factor that i have talked about i i do need to say this about the hassle factor every time i go back to india it's less uh, you know, being, being with someone like Chetan, who knows the ins and outs, who will sort of lead interference for us. Uh, we, you know, we now stay in all heritage property hotels, uh, you know, which are all former palaces that have been converted to hotels. 
the, the hassle factor is definitely going down year by year in India as, as, as that country becomes more and more prosperous and there's some sort of prosperity that's, that's tick, uh, uh, trickling down to even the lower classes. Um, it's getting better, it's getting better every time, but you do need to be ready for it. Uh, here's the shot I, I started to prematurely talk about. This is, you can see a little bit of smoke there. This is one of the burning guts, right? Where people have uh, brought their, their, their deceased loved ones to have their bodies cremated and the ashes dumped in the Holy Ganga River. You're not supposed to take pictures. So these are uh, black market photographs, <laughs> right? Um, and, and we get off right here so that everybody can have a close-up view uh, and then go visit a temple and have a little walking tour. You know, this being a sacred place, you're going to run into lots of the sadhus. Whether or not these guys are genuinely, genuine holy men, or whether they've just figured out this is a good way to make a living by posing for photographs and then getting a handout. And by the way, as in terms of just a practical bit of advice, you, you have to count on paying for taking their photograph and you need to establish a price beforehand, right? Then there's, then there's no misunderstandings. Here's vendors uh, selling uh, flowers that are part of the, you know, people will toss flowers out onto the Ganga as, as part of their religious practice. Uh, even the laundry is beautiful. Um, this is one of the places where you might still see Dobie Wallas, right? People doing laundry um, by hand. That's, that's a disappearing art in India. Um, I know that I've gone over time here, but um, we're down to our very, very last stop. Um, just outside of Varanasi is Sarnat. Sarnath is a very uh, sacred place for Buddhists. This was the place where the Buddha, after receiving enlightenment in what is today Nepal, gave his first public speech or his first public sermon. So it's a very, very important pilgrimage destination for Buddhists. This is this great uh, Buddhist stupa here. And then every Buddhist nation in the world has built a temple here. This is a Thai temple. Those of you who've been to Thailand will recognize some of the lines there of architecture. Uh, uh, this, is, um, this is inside the, the, the Thai uh, temple. This is a Tibetan Buddhist temple, uh, beautiful inlaid ceiling. Here's a, a gorgeous mandala. Um, you know, these, these are just representative photographs, right? There are dozens and dozens of temples. And, and because it's outside of Varanasi, we make a, a morning's visit here to Sarnath and then bus everybody out to the airport. Uh, and, and Varanasi is a city of about 5 million people. So it's got a very, very good uh, airport. And we, we basically end the tour at the airport. Um, it's very easy to, to get a domestic flight back to Delhi or to start your journey home right there from Varanasi. So we, we finish up there with Sarnath and then <clears throat> on to, uh, to the airport there where we finish up. Okay, I'm, I'm finished talking about India. I just wanna check to see if there have been any more questions that came in. No, there has not. So I thank you for tuning in to see a little bit about um, our India tour. Again, to repeat, um, I have a departure that uh, I will be um, escorting on November 6th of this year. Fingers crossed that the COVID situation is all fully resolved and we're back to traveling by then. And then Sarah is going to be taking her group to India with Chitan. Uh, I believe that start date is October 27th of 2022. You can check that on our website, either Sarah's Adventures with Sarah.net or on the imprint website, imprinttours.com. And I do thank you for your attention and your questions and uh, get out there and travel and travel with intent. <laughs>